You may have seen recent news about the MyQ Smart Garage Door Opener by Chamberlain. Chamberlain released a statement saying they're removing third-party unauthorized access to their garage door opener. This caused quite a stir because there are a lot of smart home users who like to use Home Assistant and to integrate everything they can into uh, Home Assistant. In response, Home Assistant posted on their blog that they're going to remove the MyQ integration because it would no longer work with uh, MyQ products. And Ars Technica covered the news story about the blog post that Home Assistant made. So everybody's been talking about this integration being removed. And you know, even though it's considered unauthorized access by a third party, this left a lot of people who are using Home Assistant with MyQ uh, you know, dead in the water. And basically their smart home garage does not work. You have to use the first party app or nothing if you want to be able to use the MyQ garage door opener. This left a lot of users unhappy for good reason because no, they can no longer use the product that they're paid for in the way that they want to use it uh, in, their, in their preferred smart home platform of choice, such as Home Assistant. I would like to mention, if you wish to keep your MyQ garage door open, there is a uh, hardware solution out there that's been created to actually allow you to have local access and home assistant to your garage door opener. The price of it with a power cord is almost the same as a Z-Wave solution, so if you want to start over with the Z-Wave solution I mentioned in this video, that's, that's a possibility. At one point in time, I actually considered getting a MyQ garage door opener before I considered home assistant and other smart home technologies, because it's kind of like one of those go-to products that you can, you know, use that's very convenient to know if your garage door is open or closed, especially if you go to work and you've forgotten, you're like, oh no, you know, you don't want to leave your house open, right? So what I like to do is I want to show how I have my garage door set up using, you know, Z-Wave products, but you could use Zigbee or some other type products. To make my garage door smart, I'm actually using the Zeus Zen 16 multi-relay. I believe mine is the 500 series uh, Z-Wave device, but they actually have a newer 700 series Z-Wave Zen 16 version two. So I noticed on their website. So if you want a little bit newer Z-Wave protocol, they have a 700 series, which might actually work a little bit better as far as like range and that kind of thing. But the one I have seems to work pretty great. I'm actually making use of a Zeus tilt and shock sensor. Uh, you don't need to use the shock sensor part of it, which is the vibration, um, but you can use the tilt uh, functionality. It has two different sensors in it, so you can actually use that sensor for two different purposes. So let's go over to the garage and I'll show you how I have it hooked up. So I'm standing on a ladder in my garage, so I can show you how I have my smart garage door opener set up. Uh, this is the Zeus Zen 16, as I mentioned earlier, and it's just basically plugged into an outlet up here. Fortunately, uh, there's already an outlet in the ceiling, and the garage door uh, opener itself is actually plugged into one inside an extra extra free outlet up here. So it worked out great, so I could actually just mount my box right next to the power outlet and just plug it in. So, so the wire of this is actually kind of interesting. It's pretty simple because the, the, the builders actually used Ethernet cable, which I thought was kind of interesting instead of using some other wire because it, they actually use two pairs to probably make sure it's, the, the contact is actually good enough because you know, Ethernet cable wires, you know, even you know, Cat5 or 6, is still pretty thin. It's kind of hard to strip wires that tiny without breaking it. So they actually stripped off two wires for each of these uh, posts right here. So. Uh, I just followed suit and actually used it as spare Ethernet cable as well because I have, you know, uh, extra Ethernet cable laying around. So, uh, so I actually just used it as a small piece and I connected it to the relay and I just connected it to the switch. Just like my wall switch over here, I just connected this in as like a secondary switch. So I don't actually have to wire the wall switch into this box and to be able to, to get that to still work, I can actually have basically two independent controls so that the wall control always works regardless of whether this box is working or not. This setup actually works pretty reliably, but I actually had an issue where this box would actually just, uh, just not stop responding after a while, and I'd have to unplug and plug it back in. But that's when I had um, the wall switch connected to this relay, and then I had the relay connected to this, because the diagrams show that you can connect the switch to this relay, and then the relay to the um, garage door opener. Well, if this box stops working, that wall remote actually stops working too, which is very frustrating because th that's one of the, my goals when I do smart home automation is all of the physical controls should still work. I don't want my smart home functionality to break the traditional controls because it's just inconvenient, right? If I go to hit the wall switch and it doesn't work, well, that's annoying. The, the, the key fob still worked because it, it was doing it wirelessly, right? But the switch on the wall wasn't working. So then it dawned on me, it's like, why do I have to, why do I chain that up? to this re relay when I can just, just have plug them both in because all you really need to do is just trip that relay so this garage door opener turns on. So that way I can just have, have it set up just like it is like a second wall remote connected to this. 
it doesn't matter which remote triggers it, either either one would actually work fine. Another thing I realized once I switched it back to where everything is directly connected to this uh, garage door opener is the light actually works because the, the light, the button for the light didn't work anymore for this light right here. Um, to manually turn the light on, it actually broke when I connected to this and I didn't realize it until later because I never really used that that much. So when I moved it back, it actually worked again and it, and it actually shows like a light glowing on there now where it didn't show that before. With this configuration, the wall remote works, the key fob works, and now I'll have the additional ability to turn on the garage door with my smart home functionality. With Home Assistant, you could just click the button to open the garage door now or use an automation to trigger it or you could use voice control if, depending on what voice assistant you have set up with Home Assistant. Since I have iOS devices, I actually installed the HomeKit bridge integration in Home Assistant. So then I can actually control all my smart home stuff with Siri. At first I was just kind of playing around with it because I thought it was kind of neat, but at, the more that I use it, there are certain things that I actually prefer to do with voice control than I do with actually clicking buttons on the screen on the app. So I actually have my iPad here and I'm going to do a quick demonstration of how quick it is to open up your garage door using Siri, which is not fully a local voice control. So it, it still would be even faster potentially if you had your own local um, voice control, which the Home Assistant is working on building this, this, that functionality, which you might want to take advantage of. But anyway, so let's try it out. Turn the garage door opener on. And if I do it again, while the garage door is still opening, it is, it'll stop halfway just the same as if you push the button and you push the button again before it, it opens, it'll just open halfway, right? So you can actually you know, control it just the same way as you would a garage door. And you see how quick it responded because I just said it a few seconds before and then I did it again a few seconds later and it actually stopped like it's supposed to do. And so if I do it a third time, it'll go back down all the way. Turn the garage door open on. Okay, <laughs> I even have my garage lights set up to use Home Assistant as well. So I can say, turn off the garage inside light switch. And so now we're in the dark. So uh, turn on the garage inside light switch. So see so how, so how quick that is? And that's not even local voice control. Imagine if you had full local voice control, how much even quicker that would be. I mean, that's still very, very fast. So, um, but I, I have an inside light switch and I have an out, outside light switch on the outside of my garage. That's why I have to say, garage inside light switch. So you have to be kind of specific with the commands, but once you get used to saying uh, what you called your switches, it actually works pretty well. Another thing is this kind of a little side note is uh, you can actually group uh, some of your entities within um, Apple Home app. Even though it's not grouped together in Home Assistant, you can group it on Siri. So when you actually say, like I have two light switches out back, I could say, I could group those in a, in a group that called backyard lights. And I could say, turn on the backyard lights and it'll actually turn both of them on instead of me having to say that light and then turn that light on. So it's actually pretty cool. I actually make use of that when I'm outside in the dark, I'm walking a dog around the house. I can say, turn on the backyard lights with my phone and I'm not even near the switches. That's when, to me, voice control is very, very handy. If I'm in the same room as a light switch, I'm not gonna say turn on the light switch because I can just flip it on, right? I'm right next to it. It's quicker just to flip the switch, right? But if I'm outside walking around, it's very inconvenient, especially if I'm like a couple, a couple hundred feet from the house, I'm walking around my fence. I'd have to go inside my fence and go in the house and it might even be locked downstairs or out, you know, whatever. So it, you know, I wouldn't even have access to the light switch. So to turn your garage door on, you don't uh, technically need a garage door tilt sensor, but I recommend having a tilt sensor because it, it, that, that kind of completes the piece of knowing whether or not your garage door is actually open or shut. Cause that's very handy when you're, when you drive away from your house that I, leave my garage door open or not, and you're like, I don't know. And you can, you can just open up your app and look at it, and you can see the status of whether it's open or closed. So I'm gonna do a quick demonstration and showing an automation that you can do. If you have a garage door tilt sensor, I'm gonna arm my security system. I have the garage door tilted just enough to where the sensor says it's open. And I recommend putting the sensor near the top of the door as high as possible, because when it starts cresting, it'll, it'll say it's open when the garage door is just open a little bit. Whereas if you put it near the bottom, it has to be almost open all the way right before it says it's open. So you get a little quicker notification. So I have mine put near the top so that way you get a you get it sooner. So actually I just had my door just barely cracked. And so 
I'm going to arm the system. It actually will turn my lights off too, so the, the video is going to get dark because I have it shutting all my lights off when I arm my security system in case I leave the light on. This is pretty cool because you can save some power, right? You don't wake up and your lights on all, all night, right? So you'll see the lights will go off in the garage and then I'll get a notification from a home assistant on my iPad and it'll say, your garage door is open, right? And it won't actually close it because I want to make sure that the sensor is not lying because it, the battery died or something, right? <laughs> so here we go. I'm going to hit home. I'm arming it. Takes a few seconds. There we go. See, I got a notification on my iPad just now that my garage door is open. So then I can take action. Um, so as you can see, it's kind of dark right now. So let's do this. Turn the garage inside light switch on. There we go. We got our lights back now. So let me disarm my system before I forget and trigger it. Okay. So as you can see, it's pretty cool you get to have those automations to be able to do those kinds of things. So not all smart home automations have to physically do something that's really cool, like turning the lights on and off and that kind of thing. So, uh, I feel like a lot, like half of my automations are just notifications that say, hey, the humidity is too high, you might need to change your you know, humidifier. If you have a water leak sensor and you get water on the floor, which I sometimes do with my HVAC, so it's important for me to have those notifications and say, hey, you might want to check on this, there's something important happening. So that's where, to me, that's where that smart home functionality is very helpful just as much as actually doing something like turning the lights on and off automatically and those kinds of things. So just being situationally aware of what's happening in your house and your house telling you is pretty cool. It's, I think it's pretty neat that my smart home in my house is telling me there's something I need to look at because something is happening that I am interested in. Oh, that, that's so cool. It's like my house is telling me it, I need to... to to, t to do something to take care of it or whatever, right? I hope you find this helpful to see how valuable it is to have local control, uh, with, especially with Z-Wave stuff. As long as there's Z-Wave software and Z-Wave hubs and smart home software like Home Assistant especially, as long as we have that and that exists, I can use that software until this device dies. I don't have to worry about like a company just yanking access to it. I have access to it. One more thing I want to mention is if you want to have remote access, use to, to open and close your garage door. What I do is just use WireGuard VPN on my OpenSense box. And I actually have my phone set up to where if I want a different Wi-Fi network other than my home network, because you can do exclusions on the iPhone app, and then, or, or when I'm on a cellular connection, it automatically connects back to my home network and I have access to my entire network just the same almost as I'm locally on my network, which is very cool. I put all the firewall rules on my WireGuard interface that I, for the access that I want to have into my network. I can access Home Assistant from my phone through WireGuard and it's like, a, it's like seamless. It's almost like I'm at home using my home automation. It's so fast because WireGuard protocol works pretty fast because you get a nice secure connection to your home network and you're not going through the cloud. You're just going straight to your network. No cloud connection. I don't have to worry shutting down my service. I hope you find this topic interesting even though it's something different than I normally cover, but, but I have been dabbling in smart home stuff and I might include a few random smart home uh, videos from time to time because it's, I think it's interesting. And it does eventually connect into your home network. So having a nice home network where you have your IoT devices separated from your other devices, you might want to put Home Assistant on your IoT network because uh, Home Assistant communicates with a lot of IoT devices depending on what you have. So until next time, I'll see you guys later.